maybe because the time is limited, let's maybe start. Sure. And I'll, I'll tell you that I've been um, spending some number of, of years trying to figure out how to, um, how to um, describe what the process is of chelation and of picking up things inside your body. And a good way to think of it is that chelation is much like, <laughs> it took me some time to, to find the name of what this thing is, but there's an arcade game that maybe a number of us have played as children, maybe in grocery stores, where there is a crane with a magnet on it, and it hovers over things that can pick them up and then uh, drop them down a chute and you receive it like a, whatever, a plastic ring or a little fuzzy animal. But basically with the principle is, is this, and it's like this arcade magnet crane game. And that is that um, chelation with, with most chelators, like DTPA and EDTA, is based on electrical forces, magnetic forces. So DTPA has very high affinity for gadolinium and other heavy metals. And to just give you some numbers, and I didn't, um, since this is informal, I didn't look this up to give you exact numbers, but essentially DTPA has a stability log constant, or we just call it a stability constant. Um, and that reflects how powerful it hangs on to different things. So with gadolinium, the stability log constant for um, DTP is about 20.8 and for EDT is something like 17.5. So those are log values. So that translates into something over a hundred thousand times more powerful um, uh, affinity for gallium the DTPS than EDTA. And that's one of the reasons why I really focused on DTPA. But if we look towards the future and we're using this variable, we have that this science of chelators and stability has been established for 50 years. And it, it does make a lot of sense. So I know we're all a little bit, and including myself, a little bit skeptical of what's happened in medicine to us. But there's some things that we have to sort of accept as, as important uh, scientific principles. So HOPO, which is something that I think all of us are thinking about, they describe the stability for gadolinium with HOPO, something more in the range of 26, which is then several fold higher than DTPA. And that would mean that it's even a much better chelator. Now we could also, and I'll, I, want, I don't want to dwell, dwell on this too long, other chelators that are used in MR contrast agents are more powerful, but they're not FDA approved for use as a chelator. So for instance, multi agent, its ligand that gadolinium is bound to is BOPTA. And that again is something like a thousand times more stable with gadolinium than DTPA. So it's something like 22 when DTPA is something like 20. So stability is very important because it reflects how tightly it holds on to the thing that um, uh, in this case that we wanted to hold on to. So much like the game, if we look at the game, DTPA is like a very powerful magnet on the end of that string on the crane. So when it looks at, you know, when you circle it around all the toys in there, each of the toys also have different strength little magnets on it. So using this analogy, our native metals in our body like magnesium, like manganese, are much weaker magnets they have attached to them than does gadolinium or other heavy metals like lead and like uh, plutonium, which is uh, one of the uh, metals that um, actually FDA, uh, uh, DTP is FDA approved for. So the point being that the magnet on the crane is very much attracted to the magnet of heavy metals in preference over the weaker magnets of the uh, native metals in our body. Now we can take it one step further 
we want to compare zinc DTPA to calcium DTPA, it's like there is a little cover on top of the magnet on the crane. Zinc will only pick up metals, or in general, a um, a chelator when it's um, uh, when it's uh, um, injected in the body. It is bound at a certain level of strength in binding. Zinc and DTPA are really quite strongly bound to each other. So DTPA does not readily give up zinc. It only gives up zinc to a more powerful um, um, metal. And that would be all the heavy metals are basically more powerful. So zinc DTPA only releases uh, the DTPA to, be, to pick up other metals that have been more powerful. Calcium bound to DTP is a very is a relatively weak bound, so it releases it rather readily. And that means it picks up also metals in our body, but it picks up relatively speaking more uh, gadolinium as well. So that's one of the reasons when I chelate oftentimes, most often, I will start with the more powerful chelator which is calcium DTPA, recognizing it's also picking up a bunch of our metals that we don't necessarily want to lose. But then on DT on, on the second day, uh, I use zinc DTPA, and zinc will sort of do, um, if you like, uh, clean up, as I envisage it, of gallium that's been loosened in the tissues but not removed. Zinc picks up some of that. And also in picking that up, this is the zinc that calcium had removed the day before in the body. So that's something that it's kind of a complex, even though making it, trying to make it simple with the arcade game, it's still a little bit complex, but that's basically the principle. Um, and the principle is that DTPA is much stronger than ETTA, but there's other agents that we're thinking about in the future that are even stronger still than the DTPA. And we're thinking that's probably the direction to go to have things that bind more more tightly. Now, all different metals have different with different uh, of these uh, chelates again. So every one of them, DMPS, DMSA, EDTA, actually have different things that they're much more stable with than DTPA. And that's, of course, beyond what I want to talk about here in this presentation. So that's sort of the baseline that I wanted to um, just leave you with. And also the, the idea is that that's basically all it's doing. It's picking up metals and then holding on to them better than other chelators, holding on to gadolinium. So much, much less likely to re-release it right away back into the pool of, of, uh, of toys, much more likely than to take that metal and drop it down into the chute which in this analogy is the kidneys and the nephrons and the renal collecting system and into you know the outside world. So we want to have something that is that tightly binds gadolinium, doesn't re-release it right away, hangs on to it to 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 it being um, eliminated. And the the path like multi-hands, which does um, get eliminated also by the biliary system to a small amount, and EUVIST to a considerable amount also um, gets eliminated in the biliary system. So with with that, and, and I can also come back and address any questions about what I said just now, but if you could, Deb, if you could um, ask me some of the more uh, pressing and more common questions, then I'll address them now. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I, I think I think that the it's um, coming out of the shoot talking about zinc and the difference between zinc and calcium was important because that was the number one question that we got. People voted on the questions um, that people posted, and that was the one that got the most likes and and notices on the the board was understanding the differences. And I think um, along that lines, a follow-up question that came along that maybe you could talk about is, 
do you see a difference in the chelating brands um, of when you're chelating different brands of gadolinium and then differences oh. between linear and um, macro? Okay. Now, um, you know, it, it's interesting at this point, and I know that, that my colleague Brent Wagner has also spoken to your group and has said, well, you know, there's not enough. Um, he's nervous about the fact there's not enough or a lot of experimental evidence about these chelators. It sort of ignores though, the, the path that generally medicine follows and, and medicine has generally, except maybe in the most recent 10 years, the observation of various phenomena and then over the period of time, then answering the scientific questions that relate to them. So I've always been of the opinion, if something makes sense um, scientifically, and it also works in practice, even if you don't understand everything about it, if there's no other good option, do the best thing that you can, which is also uh, safe to uh, manage people. So, you know, a number of people, I think, in your community as, as well, sort of think, well, geez, HOPO is supposed to, and again, we don't know yet, but it's supposed to, and as I said, theoretically, it is supposed to be better than DTPA. It also will be orally administered. Maybe I should just wait to uh, when HOPO is out uh, before I chelate. And, you know, I can understand that point of view, but it really depends on how sick you are. And we don't know when it will be coming out, and we don't really know ultimately, you know, at this point, how good it will be in humans. So to be very sick and to be waiting for something that we don't know when it's going to happen may not be the best idea if we have something that actually works quite uh, quite well. So getting back then to your specific question, uh, actually, even in our very first paper on uh, chelation with DTPA, we found that, you know, when we, when we uh, chelated patients who had um, linear agents such as Multihance and Magnavist, that we were getting, on average, 20 times more gadolinium out following chelation than the native uh, urine prior to chelation. So uh, at least 20 times more to in the range of 20 to 40 times more. But what we don't uh, understand fully, but I have some theories on it, macrocyclic still in our study, um, we found that about 10 times more um, gadolinium was uh, removed with um, uh, of, that were macrocyclics compared to um, native urine. So there was still a lot of removal of, of macrocyclic agents. Now, that is somewhat perplexing because of the fact that, um, and, uh, you know, a number of these things are controversial, so I'll tell you my theory on, on all of this. I think that uh, linear agents, when they're in your body after, after maybe even a couple of months, probably um, a third of it may be in a fully intact uh, contrast agent that was, that was um, uh, administered to you. But probably a third is bound to um, things like phosphate and uh, carbonate, forming these sort of small, stable molecules. But a sizable percentage of it is probably adhering to molecules that bind it less tightly. And most of these are macromolecular proteins. And so just to digress for one second, and those macromolecular uh, proteins down to gadolinium is most likely what we see on the brain when people say, well, you know, an MR of the brain, you know, you can see high T1 signal in the dentate nucleus. Well, probably what you're seeing is just the gadolinium that's bound to um, a macromolecular protein. You're not seeing uh, fully intact gadolinium. And that's why, for instance, when we administer Dotorem or Prohance, you won't see it in the brain, not even if you've given... 20 or 40 injections of the agent. And that's because the agent is still fully intact. And we're not seeing fully intact agent in those locations. We're seeing um, it bound to protein, which has a much higher T1 relaxation 
than in its native contrast agent, and that's why we can see it mm. on two unweighted images. We can't see the amount of gadolinium that's deposited when it's um, in macromolecular form. Doesn't mean it's not there. It is there in your brain with my, and it's there in my brain. I've had 13 injections of gadolinium. I have that in my brain as well. So um, why it removes macrocyclic agents? I think it's because, and if we look again at the, um, at the, the description of the game of, a ma of the, game of the um, magnet crane, the magnet crane, on the magnet crane is a powerful magnet. Now, yes, gadolinium is still fully intact in something that surrounds it, but it's still a small molecule. And still gadolinium has a powerful magnetic um, property to it. So I think what's happening is that, um, and, it, and I'll use this as a lead into another point that I think is extremely important to understand, but um, it sort of then can pull the fully intact uh, uh, agent out of tissues. And I think it may let it go at some point when it's in the blood circulation. But as with the original injection, where the vast majority of it actually is eliminated in the kidneys, if your kidney function is normal, the vast majority of that agent that's been pulled fully intact into the bloodstream and released back into the bloodstream, the vast majority of it is still going out through your kidneys and eliminated. But it allows that description allows me to turn to another uh, topic, and, and that this may be one of the questions. But when you look at how anything has been administered to the body, and again, you know, a good example is lead will be different than gadolinium. Gadolinium is quite distinct for many other uh, metals in that it got into your body through intravascular injection. When you get lead in your body, it's either from consuming lead paint or inhaling, uh, you know, lead uh, that's aerosolized, you know, in the environment. So most, most of it is, is probably digested in some inhalational. So when something is administered a certain way, it has mud tracks along the path that it was administered. The other thing to pay attention to with, with uh, gadolinium uh, agents, and a number of you have talked to me about it and sort of have remarked in horror about it, but these agents are administered at very fast rates. So the typical rate that basically all of us, that includes me, would have had gadolinium agent administered at is two mls per second so that's awfully fast and you can say well why do they do it that way why is it not more slower well experience has shown and it actually started that experience shown in the very early earlier days using ct with iodine contrast if you administer it very slowly it doesn't really get into the interstitial spaces of tissues that well so for instance you can't identify vascular tumors that well because it's not really getting into the interstitial spaces. Most of it is sort of staying in the, in the circulation and only a small amount of low concentration is getting into the tissues. So when you see it in that terms, the faster rate, for instance, allows me to see small pancreatic cancers that are a centimeter in size because the normal pancreas has a very intense uh, enhancement because of the flooding of the interstitial space. And it has a larger interstitial space than a small, dense pancreatic cancer. So that's why it's administered at that rapid a rate. So that means not only has it been administered intravascularly, but the mud tracks of gadolinium are all in the interstitial space. So when you, you know, and, and many of you, maybe all of you have looked at the articles from Mayo and others that have shown gadolinium particles on electron microscopy in brain and other tissues, what you see when you look at it, and, and I'm not sure to what extent they sort of describe this, but you see the gadolinium in around the vessels. So most of the gadolinium that has been injected in your body is around your vessels in the interstitial space. So from my point of view, the best way to flush that out is to simulate the way it got in. So that's why I don't like uh, drip infusion, but I like 
And, you know, I hate to say it, I probably would like even a faster hand push than we do, but I do a safe hand push at about, you know, 30 seconds to a minute to administer, you know, 2.5 to 2.5 mLs of the uh, DTPA. So that would be probably a fifth the rate that the gadolinium contrast was administered into you. But I want to get it enough so that there's a bolus of that um, chelating agent that goes into your interstitial tissues and grabs the gadolinium and pulls it back into the veins and out through, you know, to the kidneys and out the majority uh, through um, through uh, the uh, urinary system. So that explains a couple of critical things about the distribution of the agent and about how it is, um, how the wisdom of having it as a push technique, and also the fact that the fully intact um, agent is a small is a small agent. So it's like you had another coating, if you like, of plastic around the magnet of the toy in the arcade game. So it's covered in a molecule. Yes, it's a but it's a thin molecule, and the magnet of the crane can still pick it up. Okay, that's. The working theory now for for certainly for prohance and dodoran and um, the agent dev that we've of course uh, discussed um that is a little bit more problematic is cannabis and i'm not sure because you know the good news about cannabis is we can actually pick up relatively speaking a fair amount of cannabis more than the other macrocyclic agents and i don't know if it's because our immune system is able to either break down completely or partially break down the gadabist, or if it's a considerably thinner, if you like, coating of macrocycle around the uh, gadolinium that it's easier to extract. But, you know, many of those same principles are probably why there's also more of it left behind, and that's probably why it's more, more likely to make an individual sick than uh, Dodorem or Prohance. But to get back to uh, one of the most important starting points, all of these agents can cause GDD, which is interesting because that's different from NSF, but it's exactly the same as acute hypersensitivity reaction. And um, there's a lot of similarities to acute hypersensitivity reaction to GDD, and that's one of the reasons why extremely early on I realized that we had to more or less treat it like an acute hypersensitivity reaction to gadolinium, and by doing so, um, administering steroids and antihistamines, which is a treatment that's been used for 50 years, 40 years, with iodine contrast, and then for a shorter period of time with gadolinium, acute hypersensitivity reaction, and that's why basically all of our patients at least start with that combination because when we pull out gadolinium and and i'll tell you it's actually for me the most important um diagnostic um assessment that the patient actually has gadolinium deposition disease and not say als or not pure ms without gdd and that is if you don't have an immune reaction to the removal of gadolinium by a powerful chelator, then you don't have GDD. So for instance, you know, that's why when I was getting this agent, I wasn't doing it the way I do it with patients where, you know, slower and split dose, you know, I was having it injected as one blast of 5 ml. So basically at a 2 ml per second rate. And even though I've had 13 injections of gadolinium, I don't react because I don't have the immune susceptibility, the immune reaction to um, to gadolinium that you people do, and I could add in the caveat, at this point, I don't have it. Now, the other thing that's, I think, important that many uh, patients suffer with, and even I hear this all the time for physicians, they say, well, and this is where the uh, immunological thing is important, they say, well, you know, I've, I've had patients get... Um, I've had patients get so many gallium injections. Nobody has had a complaint with it. This can't be gallium. This has to be something else. Nobody has, um, nobody has reacted to it. 
Well, so, it, so you know, it's not real. It's something else. Maybe you have a psychiatric condition, conversion reaction or something. But this is what you would say. I mean, it's, I consider it, this again, is the theory that we're working with. And it's basically the same concept, more or less exactly, as a, as a long haul for COVID and long haul for vaccines. It's a T-cell dysregulation. And I would like you to consider that and describe it as basically it's a T cell allergy. So it's like saying, okay, you know, I can eat any amount of peanuts and I'm perfectly fine, but there are, will you agree that there are a couple of patients who can eat peanuts and get tremendous anaphylaxis reaction? And also some of them can die or you don't think that happens, even though I can eat peanuts fine. And I know at least 50 other people I can give peanuts to and they're fine. Same principle. All of us have a unique immune system, you know, and we're sensitive to some things and not so sensitive to other things. You all happen to be very sensitive to gadolinium and you may have preceded it with other sensitivities to chemicals. But the other thing that you'll have noticed is that since then, you're also more sensitive to more other things because what gadolinium has done and it may have pre-existed gadolinium, but it certainly was amplified by gadolinium. It has caused your T cells not to function in, at least with gadolinium, not to function in the way that it is supposed to function in most people. And that is that it's presented with gadolinium. It may react the cytokine release with gadolinium, which it does with me, but a lot of that cytokines is to tell the rest of your body and other immune cells, do not react to this with inflammation, do not react to it with fibrosis, it's not a problem. And it probably, you know, my view actually now, and this is now taking things to like a 50 degree black belt in judo, my thought is that some of these T cells are probably um, releasing things that even block the cell membranes of cells so that gadolinium doesn't enter it. Because if you think about it, you know, if it's purely, you know, we've all read these articles that talk about um, gadolinium causes any number of injuries, but a very common and important one is mitochondrial injury. And a lot of you, and rightly so, claim, well, I've had mitochondrial damage from gadolinium. I've had problems with my synapses because gadolinium has inserted in place of calcium in the synapses. That's all correct. Gadolinium does that. And it's shown in animals, it does that. But how do we explain that? In the minority of people, this is what it does. How do we explain that um, people don't react if it's a simple metabolic uh, reaction, then why doesn't everybody have, have that reaction? And I think that's because the immune system plays a fundamental role in preventing that from happening in the vast majority of people, which it has lost for patients with GDD. So, so, so Dr. Samalka, can you um, expand a little bit on that in how Sometimes we tell people, wait three months before you do chelation or do anything, da 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 da, da. So okay. I, I, I kind of am following that, but I think there are people out there who are questioning. So some of us have reactions immediately, some of us don't, um, blah, blah, blah. So, why, so yeah. how do we as patients determine when do I start this detox or chelation process? Well, detox, you should start right away. So, in fact, I think I wrote a, a, a blog even to, you know, people who are nervous about gadolinium but have never had it before even or um, have, have, have therefore never reacted are just, you know, they, they you know, read your site, they see your site, they're very nervous about gadolinium and they're told they absolutely have to have gadolinium. A couple of things to say to that. Turns out you don't actually have to have anything that a doctor tells you to have. You think, well, geez, I have to get it. And the point is, no, you don't. You don't have to get it. Number one, that's important that you realize you don't have to get it. And number two, you know, there's also uh, for most things an alternative. The other thing that I usually tell people, and it's also factually correct that most people don't get gadolinium deposition disease. Most people, but you know, now that we know that everybody gets gadolinium deposited, it's probably smart not to have too many gadolinium injections, right? Because 
for a majority of people, you know, it seems to be like a threshold that, you know, once you get to a certain level of the pool, it runs over and floods everything, right? So, um, no, sorry, I, um, <laughs> Debbie, I, um, I distracted myself. Oh, no, so we were just talking, you were saying, well, start detoxing right away, but maybe right, chelation yeah, doesn't. Start detoxing right away. So what I told, you know, the, I told the woman, and this is very, and it, it's true also for all of us, this detox. And I'm not necessarily, now, I will also say, uh, this is not something I'm an expert in, but I am sort of um, good at being somewhat pragmatic. So, you know, when... And I do adhere to a number of things in conventional Western medicine, but I'm also very open to things that are non-conventional as well. But I do like to see proof that something is, is, is correct. So my point is this. I tell people, before you get a gadolinium injection, make sure that you're well hydrated and you're hydrated before. And you say, well, geez, you know, I heard that, you know, they told me that, that you know, drink water, you know, when I was reacting and I drank water and it didn't help. Well, as a general rule of thumb, that makes a lot of sense because it um, drinking water before you're not in a metabolic acidotic state, which makes everything worse, more likely bad to happen, including GDD. And afterwards, yes, it's going to help flush out the gadolinium. So that's just common sense with basically everything. So doing that. But the other thing is, you know, simple detox things that make a lot of sense. And, and there are a variety of them. But the ones that I sort of, um, and, and the other thing to remember, some things work for some people, but not necessarily for everyone. So you would be wise to, and this will get, you know, we'll talk about maybe saunas after this. Um, you'll be wise to, you know, like with many things where they say, you know, if you're using a dye or a paint, you know, test a little sample of it to see if it works. You know, I recommend with everybody, to start with something and also maybe one at a time to see if it works. But so my recommendation, fluid before, fluid afterwards, uh, water, not a lot of exercise before or immediately afterwards. Again, you don't want to do anything to throw off your uh, immune system. You don't want to do anything that will shake up your the way the dendritic cells communicate to the T cells, you want to have everything fairly calm. And that's why also the point that I made, I put in a recent blog, is if you're on something like high potency antibiotics, as much as possible, you want to wait uh, before you're not on those, unless it's absolutely imperative and urgent, because those high potency antibiotics are throwing off your immune system. So, so I like to use the analogy of one of the great philosophical observations of the later part of the 20th century, when uh, Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get hit in the face. The same is true of your immune system. It works perfectly fine for the vast majority of things and the vast majority of people, including patients who've unfortunately been struck by GDD. But if you hit it in the face, it's not going to function normally. And part of that non-functioning normally is developing GDD. So as much as possible, you want your body in a fairly calm status quo. So no, you know, major, you know, I've, I, I've heard, and you would have heard this too, of people who've, who've done like um, uh, a marathon two days before an MR or a marathon two days after an MR. Don't do any of that. So no excessive, now gentle exercise is always good, yes, but no massive exercise that's going to put you in a metabolic acidosis state. No no big time drugs that are going to throw off your immune system like antibiotics. And then, you know, as far as, you know, the, the, um, the elements I like are general, you know, when we talk about natural products, are general anti-inflammatories. So I like turmeric, I like chlorella, like spirulina so that is what i then you know if you're a normal person without any gdg and it's before you getting a, a gallon injection you know maybe maybe take turmeric afterwards for a month and you should be fine and if you want to add in the other ones yes it would probably make it even better and they also have potent effects like corella is also fairly good against mold which is something that maybe many of us now also have mold as one of the issues. 
So chlorella, actually, I'm contemplating having all of my patients take chlorella uh, just because it's, it's a good anti-inflammatory and has activity against mold. And many people have mold things. So then about the three-month thing. So I tell people afterwards, you know, do simple things like that. Now, sweating is something that for a few million years, uh, humans and many other animals have had have have been able to rely on sweating to get some toxins out. So sweating is a good way to get rid of some gallium. But again, be very careful because in a number of people, they no longer can sweat. So if you're not sweating because of gallium, you go into a sauna suddenly you are heating up your body and not getting rid of, not equilibrate, not uh, uh, evening out the temperature at all. You're just heating up your body. So you're cooking your body, making it as a metabolic acidotic stew that will uh, be a, a major setback in your health. So that's another reason, you know, if you're thinking, well, can everybody say sauna, let me try sauna, do it for five minutes first. If you're not sweating, I wouldn't even try it to begin with. So that actually is different from my original recommendations where I said, you know, use sauna. Now, you, one of the questions, too, was on infrared sauna. Now, infrared sauna, you know, there's other you know, useful effects in a variety of people. But one of the things about GDD, and many of you experience this, is that there's some electromagnetic property to it. Well, Gadolinium is, is a paramagnetic substance. So it throws off. And as you know, a number of animals have incredibly attuned magnetic um, sensitivities to different things like the Earth's core and direction and so on. So it shouldn't surprise us that we have some native magnetic things about us. So as you would have heard from, and I would estimate probably a third of your group can no longer use cell phones. And anything that is sort of electromagnetic, it just it just drives all of their symptoms crazy. You know, brain fog, head pain, all of that. So you have to, in yourself, and everyone is a little bit different. So you have to find your collection of things that work for you and probably try them one at a time. It seems to me, though, that the most innocuous are Turmeric, chlorella, spirulina, I haven't heard people really having problems with that. I've had heard huge problems with, with sauna and probably even more with infrared sauna because now you're introducing some other electromagnetic energy and you may be sensitive to electromagnetic energy. At least a third of you are. So now if you happen to have one and you're sweating fine and it's not bothering you, then of course use it. But I'm just saying, you know, be very careful when, and the reality is even for those of you who are essentially cured, you probably for the rest of your life have some kind of T cell dysregulation. So you always have to be careful with what you eat, what you touch, what you wear. You may not be able to wear certain jewelry like nickel containing jewelry anymore. You now have to be more, the one good news in that increased sensitivity to your own body is now if, if everything goes well, you actually should live better than you would otherwise because now you've been forced to be much healthier than you would have been before and, um, and, and more than most people. And I'll tell you that my experience now with what the other research I'm doing is not getting related, most people in this country are sick and are sick from inflammation because of poor diet. You now are forced to eat a good diet. You're forced to. So again, when we talk about the three months, okay, the three months is this. Because um, many people, and this is the sad story of many of you as well, that there was a injection of gadolinium that finally did you into full-blown GDD. But maybe the first, maybe the second, or even the third, you had the symptoms like pins and needles for two or three months, but it went away. Or you had brain fog or headache for two or three months, but it went away. And why did that happen? Well, your immune system on its own calmed itself down. So what I want people to do, because again, you know, it's expensive to go chelation. If you come here, you have to fly here. And the reality is that 
probably the vast majority of people with GD, first, first of all, probably the vast majority of people with GDD don't know they have GDD. But secondly, the vast majority of people with GDD, if they've just gotten one gadolinium injection, um, you know, as I see the numbers, you know, a third of them, if you, with one injection, will get better on your own. A third, you know, and usually that starts at around three months, we should see some of, some of that significantly to suggest, hey, maybe just wait and don't do anything. Maybe you'll recover on your own. In general, it's like many things in medicine, you know, a third will get better on their own, a third stay the same, and a third get worse, you know. So I'm looking for the third who gets uh, better on their own and just, you know, just keep detoxing, eating healthy foods. I prefer healthy foods to, you know, the isolated supplements in some of these foods. And a good example of this is like, um, I don't know, like a super beets. I think it was super beets. You know, there's probably 200 chemicals in a beet. And I'm, when I buy chemicals, I mean good chemicals. And there's fibrous things. And then there's probably other things like um, various amalgams that are helpful. So it's not just like one isolated thing out of the beet. It's the whole beet that's healthy. So as much as possible, I would like people to eat healthy whole things as a starting point. Sure, you know, add in some, because I was talking about supplements, but try to get a lot of these things in whole healthy foods as much as possible. Again, and I just had this discussion yesterday with a number of, you know, the patients always chelating because most people don't have any money and it's, uh, they don't because they are no longer able to work um, following um, a gadolinium and it's just a, it's just a nightmare. And that's one of the things that motivates me is that, I mean, it's just awful what what most of you have had to go through. And the point is that you can't afford to get, you know, geez, I would like to get a lion's head mushroom. That's supposed to be great. Oh, and the spinach from Okinawa, Japan is supposed to be better than other spinach. I don't know if there's data to show that really, you know, there isn't scientific data. So, but there is good data to suggest that these things are healthy and good. So get yourself what you can afford. And it makes sense, you know, eat spinach, that's healthy. Eat mushrooms, that's healthy. Eat things like um, pectin roots are, are very healthy. Um, so eat those like apricots, uh, peaches, um, and uh, nectarines, uh, figs. So many of the traditional foods are healthy, and that's why they're traditional foods. Some people, pineapple works very well with. So, you know, Find things that work for you and stay with it. And as your starting point, you know, try to start with just healthy food. But for most people, you know, try to start with healthy, affordable food. You know, you can get spinach is not that expensive. But also pay attention to, um, to you know, the, the problem with our environment is uh, this is like a perfect example of a um, healthy food that we have basically ruined. And, and, and that is kale. Uh, kale fundamentally is a very healthy food, but grown as it is in California and other places where there's lots of toxins in the soil and in the air, why um, one of the reasons why kale is so healthy is it accumulates um, sulfur, which in small amounts is, is, is a healthy component of the body, but it also then accumulates other things like thallium and cesium. So for instance, when you get 24-hour urines, and if you see um, you have high thallium, the first order of business is whenever possible to stop getting whatever, you know, what is the most likely thing that contains it. So if you have your 24 hour urines from, um, from gadolinium, you look at it, your thallium is very high, then most likely it's from kale, similar things, um, stop eating kale, you know? Uh, so, so perhaps the most important message is be attuned to your body. Uh, try things one at a time um, and try as much as possible whole foods uh, and not uh, isolated supplements because there's no guarantee that what's been isolated is the thing. And also when you get supplements, be careful. You know, ones that you get on Amazon, if they come, you know, from questionable places like Southeast Asia, maybe it in fact contains the chemical that it's supposed to remove, you know. So be very careful with the additives you get. And that's why, you know, you're probably wise to get as much as possible, uh, U.S.-based uh, companies that are uh, are very reputable, like Pure, for instance, a good supplement company. So, 
So the three month is hopefully you recover on your own. So you don't need chelation, you know, and just never get gambling again. And it's funny, you know, when doctors say, well, how it's not possible. And, but if you look at all the drugs that they advertise on TV, which now these are very expensive and these, and, you know, I have been considering them also for um, gadolinium patients. These are these um, very potent uh, anti-inflammatories like Humira and uh, Solera, uh, Ciella or whatever they are. They're, they're all on TV. And why are they on TV? Because they're multi-billion dollar drugs. But if you notice when they say the side effects, they're like severe infection, cancer, and death, right? So these are really high potency. So what we do with DTPA and with steroids, they're not potent like that, and they're not expensive like that. But um, the the point is, one of the things that's kind of funny, that I always find funny, that they say on the commercials is, if you're allergic to Humira, don't take Humira. And you kind of think to yourself, well, duh, yeah. <laughs> but the same is true of gal- gadolinium, you know? And that's what doctors also don't realize. It, you've shown yourself to be allergic to gadolinium, so guess what? Don't ever get a gadolinium injection again. And it's just the same as any of these other drugs. Right. right. So, and that's why all of you have been in the process of educating your doctors and you have to use the tools that I've been telling you as well. You know, it's basically an allergy. It's just like a peanut allergy doctor. You know that patients have uh, penicillin allergies. I happen to have an aller- aller- allergy to cyclosporins. So one diaper surgery, I got cyclosporin. Uh, so, um, no, no, what am I saying? Uh, those cephalosporins. Um, and um, I had I went completely be red. So um, you know we're all aller- we all have some sort of sensitivities to different things. Now many of you, as you know, you started off with what you would call either uh, pot syndrome or mast cell activation syndrome or multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome. That tells us that you, as a baseline, your immune system is very sensitive to various chemicals. And unfortunately, you were trapped by gadolinium as well in that. So So when you're talking about that, maybe um, what's the good news? Like, so our T cells are out of whack and we're having cytokine storms and everything. And we're, we're eating healthy now. We're doing chelation. We're detoxing is do and the cells are always replacing themselves and they're getting better and the body's renewing the cells all the time so do you think that people who do like chelation or not um at some point do our bodies just come back into a homostasis place where it will go away you know well yeah you know i think the reality is is for that to occur in somebody who's had multiple gallium injections and is quite sick is essentially the likelihood is zero. And, you know, I, I like to use um, autoimmune diseases because it's, this is basically like an autoimmune disease. And I, I wrote in one of my blogs uh, the new term used for that whole family, which includes gallium immune-mediated uh, sensitivity syndrome, something like that. But I've, I've written a blog about it. But the point being is that um, all of us are a little bit different, our immune systems. And, you know, for instance, we'll take Crohn's as an example. Crohn's, probably the vast majority of people with Crohn's, they have some indigestion, occasionally abdominal pain, easy to have diarrhea, but that's about it. But at the end or, other end of the spectrum, the same disease process, you have people that the disease is worse than almost any cancer I've seen. You know, some of these severe cases of Crohn's is just the most devastating. Same is true of, of GDD. I suspect the vast majority of people um, just have very mild GDD. They react to it. And that's why, again, you know, the, um, the recommendation for noticeable GDD is maybe you're in the group that just recovers on your own. The only thing is pay attention to what they say on TV. If you're allergic to Humira, don't take Humira. You think, well, how am I allergic to Humira unless I take it? The same is true of GD, uh, gadolinium uh, based contrast agents. You, you had gadolinium based contrast agent, you reacted to it. Your first treatment, the first treatment, is never get that again. Right. Know? Okay, well, we have about just less than 10 minutes, and you had said maybe we could open it up to some questions. Right. Well, I, I think I managed to unmute myself. Okay, so, good. Okay, I'll go ahead and sure. And, and ask questions. 
Um, uh, hi, uh, Dr. Smelt. It's, um, uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, to, uh, to talk to you. Um, question is about zinc specifically. So I know that um, there is there is uh, some things in the books about zinc causing transmetallation. Uh, I think one one of the earlier documented cases of uh, of, of, uh, of some kind of gadolinium poisoning was in someone who overdosed on uh, on zinc containing denture adhesive and ended up uh, becoming uh, gadolinium toxic. And I know from um, from anecdotal things, I myself. Um, anytime I have zinc supplements and even very, very small amounts, like, you know, a small portion of a pill, it will flare my gadolinium symptoms. And I've, I've heard something similar from some other people who suffer from GTD. Um, given all that, how do you think that that plays along with using um, zinc uh, in the DTPA? You know, that, that's actually a, that's an extremely good question. And it's actually one of the reasons why I now will, will you know, if I have a lecture and people are more or less here and we can look around at different um, uh, strategies, is why I will do it this way now. Because all of my publication has talked about it, and it generally is true in medicine that you have one sort of regimen, you do the regimen, and it, it works for the majority of people. But you make a very good point. So there are some people, for instance, that you wouldn't maybe want to use calcium DTP with, for instance, because it removes more native metals, and also it does result in a more strong uh, flare because you're removing more gadolinium. So for many people, I may have them start and stay with zinc DTPA. But when we use the combination of calcium and zinc DTPA, the zinc DTPA does leave zinc behind in your body. And as you're saying, now, it's funny, you know, for most purposes, zinc is considered a good thing for skin and so on. But this gets back to the point I was making before. You have to understand your body. So, for instance, if so I tell everybody who gets zinc DTPA, uh, you know, yeah, multivitamins are probably a good thing particularly with minerals, you know, three days after the chelation, particularly with calcium, because you've pulled out manganese and you've put, pulled out magnesium. So that's why, for instance, I'll tell a number of people, maybe three days later, you know, you can take a uh, magnesium supplement, but I prefer, you know, you look up what foods contain a lot of magnesium, take that to, to, to re, um, replenish the magnesium that's been removed. But, you, but you're right, and it, it, it's funny, you know, the science behind a lot of these things not fully known, but so that's why I go with observational. And if you are if you don't do well with zinc, then you shouldn't be getting zinc DTPA. And you wonder, you know, and um, there is literature on zinc in general, and, you know, a lot of it is fairly complex, but one of the things about zinc is the metal that's most most commonly used in the family, which is apparently quite large, the mel metalloproteinases. So a huge family of enzymes and proteins in the body. Zinc is most is the most common element in it. But you could say, well, you know, maybe um, you have sensitivities to zinc because you have already enough zinc. If you get too much zinc, maybe you're creating. Uh, enzymes that are making you sick. So the fact is, you know, when we're in the circumstance that we don't really understand, and at some level, I find the science is incredibly interesting, fascinating, but we don't understand it fully at this point. In that setting, you have to do what you know um, is for your body the best thing. For most people, zinc DTPA creates a, a very... Um, gentler chelation because it removes less gadolinium. And why do people get a flare from gadolinium? Two reasons. One, you're removing more gadolinium, which is a good thing. And two, you know, people do have, although it's the same immune reaction, there's varying in the severity of the reaction. So in your case, you're saying you're sensitive to zinc. So that tells me you should never get zinc DTPA, just calcium DTPA. So what I have done now, rarely, not that often, because not many people complain of zinc, but some people who are on our protocol say, you know, after the zinc, I feel a little bit 
sick, I get more tremor ears or, and, and other various things like that. So that tells me to drop the zinc, that for whatever reason, they are reacting to the zinc, maybe having the zinc surplus in their body, which is high for one day afterwards. The body has a tremendous ability to achieve homeostasis, but it takes a week. Some, for some reason, that's not working well for me. You don't want to get zinc to TPA. So one thing that I have done is actually try individual chelators on their own with people just to see, you know, what does better, what, but that becomes very complex, time consuming. So how I generally do it, you know, if I had someone like yourself coming, you're telling me up front, you know, I haven't done well with zinc. Well, okay, then we're not going to give you zinc. We'll start with half dose calcium. Other people, if it's not sure, you know, I, I typically now start with half dose zinc and with pretty high dose uh, steroids and that's because it's very difficult to predict first time through how people will do with chelation because for one thing you know there are some people and it's a relatively common combination of acute hypersensitivity reaction which should be a mast cell reaction and gdd which should be a t-cell reaction it's very common for both of those to be occurring in the same individual now if it should happen that the type of acute hypersensitivity reaction they have is anaphylactoid, which would mean can result in death, I don't want to be in that situation that I put them in a situation that is life-threatening. So I treat them at first, the first time through, as if they are going to have an anaphylactoid reaction by giving them IV steroids, IV antihistamines. This treatment that is used for for severe. Now, I've never had anybody with an anaphylactoid reaction. And it's interesting, GDD, as sick as most people are, think pure C, pure GDD, and I don't know why, even though you do have cytokine storms, it's not a lethal kind. Now, I suspect it's probably because the cytokines that you're releasing are slightly different than the cytokines for other things like acute pure acute hypersensitivity reaction, that it will not start cascades like complement cascades and maybe other cascades that will throw you into a um, cardiac rhythm that will be fatal, like ventricular uh, tachycardia, and then, um, you know, eventually uh, uh, heart failure, or, you know, with, a, with, a, with an irregular heartbeat that you can't recover from. So we've never had that with GDD. And I think it's because that that family of cytokines doesn't create that. But the cytokine family in acute hypersensitivity reaction does. So the first time through, I treat people small amount of chelator and, um, and big time steroids if they do perfectly fine, their flares are only three out of 10 then I'll look at increasing the chelator, removing the IV steroids. So the idea of bringing up many people to full dose calcium, full dose zinc, many people, and this wouldn't be you, uh, full dose calcium, full dose zinc, day one calcium, day two um, uh, zinc DTPA, and reducing the amount of oral steroids. Because again, the other thing about steroids is that steroids can also, on their own, and high doses can do basically every bad thing in your body that you could imagine. <laughs> okay. So that's why I've done it as just an envelope and not as, as they do with asthma or traditionally with things like Crohn's, where it's high dose for months or years. I want people to do, just take steroids as you would, you know, when they talk about a, a steroid taper pack that you would take for poison ivy or something like that. I want them to taper off fairly quickly. I'm going to stop you there, Dr. Samalka. I think... Um... What I'd like to end with, and you correct me or um, finish out the, the hour here, but uh, what I heard throughout this uh, conversation, and I think it's been really good, and I, I want to thank you for taking time to meet with us. Um, what I'm hearing is everyone's body is different, so we should know our body. We should do all the things that we can to, you know, um, just treat it right. Yeah, and everyone's going to react differently, right? So we're all unique in that way. Now, um, in the uniqueness notes, someone just <laughs> sent a text that maybe I can finish off, off on that. And I think that's the, the point 
uh, Debbie, and you also have to listen to yourself and don't be talked into by doctors or family members to get different things. And for the vast majority of the things, there are options. You know, it's not only, and say so you can't get, you know, we can't do breast imaging because we need to give gadolinium with the MR. Well, there's all these options, right? And, and, and they can be figured out. It's just, it's sort of uh, intellectually lazy to say that there's no options. But remember, I'm also very concerned about radiation. So I don't like radiation. One of my lessons for most people is we get imaged too much. And I'm always surprised with patients with GDD. They seem, a number of them seem to be all too willing to then get other imaging that the doctors tell them for their heart and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Didn't you just get gallon deposition disease because you were told by a doctor to get that study? <laughs> you know, what makes you think that this other study will be good? Um, so I'm always telling people, you know, you have to be careful. In the modern age, we order too much imaging. But, you know, the question is, what about if you're allergic to steroids? Well, a number of people have told me they're allergic to steroids. And maybe some of them... It's true, but steroids um, is what our body makes itself to control inflammation. And some people, um, and I'm not being critical, and I have had a number of patients who told me, you know, I'm allergic to steroids. And actually one patient who said, I'm allergic to steroids, I can't do this thing. So one of the things I actually tell people, because having an uncontrolled flare, which I, I've had people who've had very strong flares when I've delayed giving them, because I was looking at cytokines, so I didn't give them um, steroids till day two. Flare was so bad, they thought, well, this is awful. I'm never get, you know, I'm not ever going to get chelated again. And meanwhile, their results were perfect from the point of view of removing a lot of gadolinium. It's just that we did it too aggressively. And that's why I start everybody now very gently so they get the idea of the flare. So, steroids. Somebody told me, you know, I can't take steroids. I, first thing I told them, well, I need to give you steroids. If you can't take steroids, you have to go somewhere else. And then coming back and forth about the steroids, I want to come there. But again, I said, okay, well, here's what I suggest you do. Why don't you go get skin tested for steroids to see if you're allergic to the steroids that were used? Methylprednisolone and the same agent is solumedrol or you could get other steroids tested, prednisone, see if you, if you have a skin reaction through an allergist. So this individual didn't get a skin reaction. We gave the usual approach and they did perfectly fine. And the thing is that you never know when people think they're allergic to steroids, well, maybe other things were happening, other drugs. So that's why, you know, I'm very hesitant not to use steroids, particularly if people are very sick. Now, if you're not that sick, you know, most of the people who have been, chelated well before I got into this business and some of them I know Debbie are, are very good friends with they they sort of were biting the bullet like the whole oh, days in the wild west of getting a you know something a, a bullet cut out of you and bite on a bullet to, to control the pain some people you know live through severe flares and I think you know it's possible to start with half dose um, zinc would be lower or if you can't take zinc, half dose calcium, you could go even lower um, as an option. But my first thing would be, let's make sure that you're allergic to what we're giving you. Um, and let's get a skin injection. Just like, you know, you could get skin injections for different agents. Now, I wouldn't recommend, for instance, any of you who you got, um, we'll say you got um, you got um, a GDD for multi and said, so, well, you know, they want me to get a breast MR with gadolinium. Maybe I can skin test and see if I'm allergic to proline, stoderim, and uh, cannabis. And I think, well, yeah, that's a bit risky. I, I kind of think that you should consider yourself allergic to the full class of gadolinium. If you have bona fide GDD, don't get another gadolinium injection again. But if it's something, you know, that maybe you need for other things as well, if you say, well, I'm allergic to uh, steroids, I would say, I hate to say it, but I'm not really sure why don't you get skin tested for it? And that way you know, because steroids are used not only for this, but used for many other things. Uh, so, you know, skin test. So that's actually a very small, but, uh, but uh, interesting point. Well, thank you, Dr. Samalka. It's always good to spend time with you. We'll probably schedule you again at some point. Um, I think this is where we, we did record this at your, uh, with your permission. So we probably will post it onto the group so people can listen to it because there's a lot of people who couldn't attend today. So thank you so much. Um, I'm okay, going to, all right. Thank you for
Take care, everyone. We'll do this again soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for hosting us. We all appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. We'll talk soon.